let's start. Um, well, first of all, welcome to Oxfam. Um, thank you for joining us here in Elisaba um, for the talk about mirror architecture by Ana Monviedro. Um, I'm Daniela Hartmann. I'm the co-director of the postgraduate course Interior Space Design Private Parameters. Actually, this lecture is part of our masterclass that has just taken place three hours prior to this event. Every year we choose a unique subject um, for, this, for this masterclass that has a certain complexity and relevance for interior spaces and is taught by specialized uh, professionals. So I'm very pleased to welcome Anna Monviedro, who has been invited to this year's masterclass. Welcome, Anna. Thank you very much. I'm um, very glad that you're here. And I just heard that um, the class before was a total success. Um, as you know, I'm personally and, yeah, let's say professionally also very interested in this topic. And I try actually in, in each course that I teach um, at, at the school, tr I try to convey my to my students the importance of the relationship between um, people and space and how space affects our emotions. And neuro architecture is a term that actually I didn't know myself <laughs> um, until I stumbled upon Anna's website. And immediately I felt that she's the right person who can bridge the gap uh, between what I'm teaching about architectural space and um, neurosciences, the field of neurosciences, which I practically know nothing about. So I believe that in order to create meaningful spaces, we need to incorporate in the future and, and, and now. <laughs> Um, into the design process. to 45 minutes, 50 maximum, so we can talk afterwards because I think the most interesting parts come up when we 
share conversation and, and you raise questions. Okay, so um, my my talk, I'm going to be moving around because I prefer to to move around. Um, I named it a new perspective on design because I strongly believe that we have now the chance of incorporating what we can learn from neuroscience into architecture in a very unique way. And I hope that this is something that I can convey today with you guys. So this talk is going to have two sections. First, I'm going to try to share with you my view about what's called neuroarchitecture, which I think that it's more likely to be a mindset, okay, not a discipline or a way to perform architecture, but a perspective, a mindset that, that we have to practice. And that will help us uh, produce a new paradigm, a new definition of architecture. And um, I will share with you, for first time in English, uh, the project Playing Spaces, the one that was at the Viennale, which I think it was a beautiful project that I did with two other beautiful women, and uh, that I'm, I'm very happy. And I brought some of the pieces so you can so you can see it as well. Okay, which was an application of neuroscience into architecture. All right, so talking about this mindset to a, a new paradigm, I want to share with you a text. Sorry, I should have prepared this. Excuse me, I need both hands. So this is a text um, I read in 2013, right before submitting my, my PFC, what we call in Spanish, my, my final project, and uh, changed my mind completely. So I'll share it with you. It says, if you enter to the cathedral in Amiens at twilight while an organ is playing and find that your heart uh, skips a beat, it's because your brain, not your heart, has filled you with awe. Cells in your brain are gorging themselves with a sudden flush of blood, raising your temperature, quickening your pulse, and flooding you with memories. Light flooding through stained glass windows is stimulating the V4 area of your visual cortex. Bach's music is vibrating within the cochlea of your inner ear and sending signals to the auditory cortex. The musty smells of centuries pass register unconsciously on the olfactory neurons at the bridge of your nose. And it ends up saying, you are experiencing architecture. This was written by John Paul Everhart in 2003, when they co-founded together with Fred Gage, the ANFA, the Academy for Neuroscience uh, uh, for Architecture. And when I read it, I was like, this is what architecture is about. It's not about building with materials, but building with stimuli that, you know, talk to our bodies, okay? And then I said, yeah, but why and how? <laughs> so that's where my trip started. Um, I, this is actually me at the Salk Institute, because I was, when I read this text, I was living in New York, and I said, I'm going there. I need to experience what they did. And if we were to set up um, an architectural time when neuroarchitecture actually happened, I would say it's this building. When Jonas Salk, who discovered the polio vaccine, met Louis Kahn, and he said, hey, Louis, I need a building that provides the same atmosphere that I got or I felt when I was in Italy and I discovered the vaccine. And they made it. This is a lovely place to be in, full of researchers who are working in their labs. It's together with, with uh, close to the sea. And the feelings that you get there help a lot in concentration. Okay? So I would say this would be, regarding the state of art, a moment where it was built for the first time, you know, like consciously speaking. Um, if we talk about theory, when uh, neuroscience met architecture, we have to speak about these two people. Um, Fred Gage, here on the right, he was the one who published the paper Neurogenesis uh, in Adult Human Hippocampus. And John Paul Everhard wrote many books and papers. And the thing is that the, the, what uh, Fred Rusty Gage studied was that placing mice in enriched environments, which are these ones here, uh, showed us that certain areas of their brain would 
improve, would get better, would get better connections, stronger connections, and they they grow actual new neurons. Okay, um, if we compare them to the ones that were living in standard environments. So when John Paul Everhart read this paper, he said, "I'm going to go to your lab, you know, and I want to see what you've done, and I'm going to suggest you we do this with humans as well." And as I as I read, Fred Gage, I think was a little bit. At the beginning, it was like, hey, this is really complex because human brain is so different and so more complex than, than my brain. But then John Paul Everhart said, but I'm going to write a book and I'm going to explain what, we, what can be done and what can we do as architects to, to improve and to you know, prove this as well. So he knew that, unfortunately, he died at uh, 2020, but he knew that there was a path you know, that we may be able to follow. And I know, I know that this is going to be a long journey, but we have to start at some point, okay? So two sentences that appear in this book that I really like. Paul said that a whole new way of regarding physics and astronomy changed the meaning of both Earth and motion. So why don't we regard architecture from a totally different perspective? Then we will be able to move forward, okay? And then Fred Gage here, he mentioned changes in the environment, change the brain, and therefore can change our behavior. Okay, so it's not because I said it, it's because someone way smarter than I am, which is Fred Gage, is very sure about this. Okay, but if we move back, we have, for instance, we have many authors talking about this topic, okay, not in such a scientific way but in a more philosophical term. Like, for instance, Junichiro Tanisaki, this amazing Japanese writer for the end of the 18th century, beginning of the 19th century, so I'm talking many, many, many years ago, he shares in his text this invisible dialogue that we have with our environment and how powerful it is with our senses. I really recommend you, you read this book. I think it's beautiful. So if we dive into neuroarchitecture today, um, what kind of things, because you know, I, I moved, I talked about the past, but nowadays, since neuroscience has evolved and many technologies are, are happening to be more accessible to us, um, we can get to use devices from different companies uh, to study the galvanic skin's response, for instance, you know, how the temperature of our skin changes depending on what we're feeling. This happened to us, you know, like you're walking on the streets and then there's a step and you're like, oh, this is the very rapid response of your body is telling you that something sh shock happens, right? Well, all these things can be measured with different kinds of technology, okay? Like eye tracking, facial emotion recognition, and so on. What I believe is the challenge is developing frameworks that help us understanding and placing this data into something that can be actually useful. Okay, now we're in the era of data, which is okay, we have a lot of data, but what do we do with this data? We need to develop frameworks, taxonomy, take samples, but we have to be aware that we're always going to leave something outside of our box, of the boxes we create. Okay, we need to be critical with what we do. But there are other things that we cannot measure. There are many things that can be measured and uh, many things that can't, you know, we cannot extract data. But this doesn't mean that it's not, it's not there. It just means that we can't measure it, okay? And it, it might sound like very simplistic, but talk to people, you know? Talk to the client, talk to the users, understand what they need, what they want, and have many conversation. Uh, make uh, surveys, many. I, I mean, it's, this is the best and most valuable source of information. I know it's data as well, but we, through conversation, we can have uh, empathic relationship and we can get to know what people need. So this is another way to dive into a neuro way of understanding our relationship with the space. And uh, this, is, this is me speaking with the kids that help us develop the project I'm going to share with you today. And um, there are many models and there are many methodologies from psychology that help you, uh, you know, create this kind of surveys. Because what happens is that in most architectural schools, we study, uh, well, as you probably know this book, because it's a wonderful tool, but <laughs> this treats humans as if they were objects. And we're not only, you know, things that move, and no, we, we are complex creatures. 
and actually we develop and we learn through interaction. So interaction with the space and with the people who live in the space is key. Uh, and I always say that the difference between a sculpture and, and, a, and a house is that you cannot and you should not interact with the sculpture. As soon as you interact with it, modify it, then, then it becomes architecture. This is my personal perspective, of course. Um, so, when I was studying, I was having these questions all the time. We were studying structures, we were studying materials, we were studying urbanism, all sorts of diagrams, you know. And then I was like, I know everything about the brakes and I have no idea about the human body. How, how, how come? How is this possible? So, when I was looking for information, I would always end up in the human brain. All, everything happened because of something related to the nervous system. So I'm not gonna, we just finished a three hour workshop with some of the students that are here today with us. So I'm not gonna go through all this to give you an insight, but I'm gonna tell you the two facts that shocked me the most when I was studying uh, neuroscience. The first one was uh, the fact that our largest organ is the skin. And, okay, this is like, well, of course, Hannah, yeah, it's the largest organ. Yeah, but you know what implication it's got? We perceive so many things through the skin. And then I don't know if you've read this amazing book by Johanny Palasma, The Eyes of the Skin, which I strongly recommend you to read. And actually read it several times, like one, and then in, in five, ten years, and then again in another 20 years, because your impressions may change, because Johanny writes in an amazing way. Um, so our skin is a door to so many of our perceptions. So just the studying the, the skin would be a wonderful way to understand how we interact with the space. And that is linked to the fact that we have 12 cranial nerves, 12 pairs of cranial nerves that connect our brain with all the parts of our body. So we, not, we do not only have one organ, which is the skin, but as you know, we have way many more. And, and that, this, is, this leads me to, to the next one. It is like we have as many senses as we think or we know or we perceive. So this is something we can train. Uh, Steve Draper from the University of Glasgow has a very interesting and very short, actually, uh, publication in which he says, the more we study our sense organs, the more senses we appear to have. Um, let's study the organs, let's study the senses, and let's study how architecture creates stimuli for these organs that we've got. But this is at least what, I, what I'm trying to do. So according to Steve Draper, we can have up to 33 senses. Um, we were doing some workshops in the last month and we were coming up with senses that he didn't mention in this chart, but we could feel. So again, th what he says, it's, you know, it's true. The more we study our sense organ, or the, everyone has different perceptions. So everyone has different uh, senses. Do you know what I mean with this? Are you, are you following, by the way? Yeah? <laughs> okay, because I know it's late. Some of you have been working. So if you need me to slow down, if, if anyone has a question, you can also, you can also ask. Because I get so excited talking about this because I love the topic. Okay, so I think this is wonderful. And I, I've been working as a, um, as a high school teacher. I was teaching in English. Yeah, I was teaching English, but I was teaching in English because very often we were doing exercises to train, for instance, we were doing meditation exercises and emotion recognition exercises, sensing as well, different senses, because it was, I think it's very healthy for them to get to know their body to the students. And the lessons, the classrooms or the group of students in which I did this kind of exercises used to improve much better in, the, in their exams and they were really good really, really good. So I think knowing our body from the insights make us better persons and better designers because we develop our empathy with others a bit better. So according to my research, according to what I've been doing, this is the, the last version of the diagram that I have done in, uh, that I have published in the Manifiesto to What's on Your Architecture, in which I've realized, and this, this may seem easy now that I can see with some perspective, but this was really complex for me to come to this. So I realized that architecture is actually building stimuli. And the stimuli that I built when I designed spaces have an impact on our organs directly. And then this impact on our organs has 
a conversation or an invisible pathway inside of our body using the nervous system. And it's the brain and our body that moves and you know flows all this information. And then we interact with the outside, with the outer space. And then the interaction we do has again an impact on ourselves. So this, this uh, cycle is what life is about, you know? This is what architecture is about. Because if you design a space and nobody interacts with it, if there is no life, then I, I don't believe this is architecture, right? In my perspective, um, and part of what I usually teach, is how along our lives, since we are born, and as we grow, our nervous system changes. So our needs, our, our body needs change as well. So for instance, babies, they all the, the, the world happens around their mouth and nose. That's, that's the nuclei of, of their perception. So they smell, they taste, and they recognize people, or basically the mother, through the smell and through the, the sense of, of taste. And we were just talking about this, that this is the reason why kids lick things, you know, because they need to uh, have, the, they need to understand the qualities of the materials through their tongue. Um, and as we grow, our needs change. And my most favorite human uh, situation, I always name it, I always mention, is when we are teenagers. Because when we are teenagers, we perfectly know how to use our body, we know how to interact, you know, we've been for 10, 15 years in the world, so we don't, the, the needs we have are not related to our body, but related to our mind. Teenagers are in search for their identity, so the space has to respond to this need. And, and this is very complex, but that's what I like it, I think. Um, because you know, teenagers, they're developing the frontal cortex, like this part of the brain that has to do with abstract thinking, with um, the impact that our actions have, with making decisions, doing things wrong, making mistakes, all these things, right? So they have to take risks, for instance. They usually lie sometimes because they have to learn. It's, it's a matter of, of behavior. So it's really intense. And actually, they do suffer very often, so I think they need our support. And well, I could talk about all of them, but since these two, the babies and the teenagers were my favorite, so, but if anyone has specific questions, we can talk about them afterwards. And I don't know everything about, you know, about every stage, but I think this was useful for me when I had to design a space, try to say, okay, so who's gonna be the user? All right, someone with dementia, all right. So I'll have to see how the nervous system of this person works, and then let's see what needs, space-wise, is this person going to have. Uh, but if we talk about newer architecture, architecture designed to interact with our nervous system, this is not something new. So I'm gonna give you a set of examples that I've seen or I've used or I found interesting. Like for instance, this uh, work done by Borromini. Okay, you would say, well, newer architecture, why? Oh, he plays with perception in such an amazing way. Did you know this gallery? Anybody? The gallery, the Palacio Spada, in, it's in, it's in, in, in uh, Roma. It's a false perspective. If you, if you say this here, you think it's like really far away, but it's actually really short. <laughs> you see? And he, he Borromini was a master. He did, he, he, geometry wise, he, the theaters that he was doing, so he was lying. He was, he was using perception and he was using geometry to trick what do you feel, you know? So imagine you want to create a really long hallway for whatever reason, but you don't have enough space. Well, just, you know, use geometry. This is a cross section of this, uh, of this gallery. You see, he changed, but he didn't only change this and this, but he also changed, we cannot see it, but you know, all, all these parts, they, they seem to have the same length, but they don't. Look at that, this is, this is wonderful. So he was tricking us. He, he tricks the, the, the user. Uh, I talked uh, about uh, Zog Institute in, uh, in San Diego, in La Jolla, and what I like about this building, and what I like, because I don't know, if, have you, has anyone been here? Have you visited? Miguel, you've been there? Yeah, Robert? 
oh, when you're in the play, when you're in there, you can tell who is an architect because architects they always go and they say, wow, they touch the always touching the cookie. Look at this, look at this, whole oh, amazing. You know, um, because we're a little bit like kids, you know, kids would lick it and we, we with our hands have to feel, we know it's concrete, yeah, but we have to feel it. And very often we say, oh, it's, it's, it's cold. Yeah, because let, let's go there because the sun is hitting and, you, and that's, that's, this one is hot. Okay, so not only for the scientists that work here, but also for the visitors, it's really like sexy, oh, like sensory speaking. Um, then I'm going to talk very briefly about um, this. It was an environmental behavior study that was done by uh, Alexander Haus. Um, and he, he wrote a paper about it named Tranquilizing Effect of Color Reducing Aggressive Behavior and Potential Violence. And uh, Alexander, what he did was that he uh, placed some uh, people, well, he was, he was bringing people into, into his, um, uh, what is it called, like uh, into the room, like well, in, in his office, and he would show to these people either a blue cardboard or a pink cardboard, and then he would do a strength test. And well, out of all the experiments he did, Almost, I think it was like 90 a lot percent of the people would perform weaker in the strength test after having looked at a pink cardboard. And uh, this was quite shocking, so like himself couldn't believe it. So what he did is that he uh, talked to the owners of, uh, of a prison and they painted the whole thing pink. And there was a decrease of violent uh, behavior or the amount of time that it was painted. And this Adam Aldert tells about this research in this book uh, and about many other things. So I, I didn't spoil it much. It was only <laughs> seven, eight pages. And, and then funny story was that afterwards, like he did, he was giving many, many talks in the States for a few years. And what they did, they, they were painting the um, football lockers of the guest team players in pink. So they would go to the, to the field a little bit weaker. And then there was, you know, committee, and they said, okay, loggers must have the same uh, outcome, you know, same, same outline, uh, same colors, same lockers, same furniture, same everything, because this is unfair, you know. Um, but it was shocking to me that this hasn't moved forward. So this, this happened, there was this research, and, and it stayed. And I think this is sad, because research has to open doors. You know, we have to continue, we have to move on, we have to use this as an inspiration to move forward. Um, other people that have worked with how the environment has an impact on the body um, is uh, Philip Raum and, and uh, the people in his studio. He is from Austria, if I'm not wrong, and I always talk about him in, in my talks. Uh, I would really like to, to speak with him. Uh, they just published this book in Spanish, Oh, it's beautiful. Like he tells, he's sharing personal experiences in which he felt that the body was very linked to the experience he was having. And he has designed structures to provide specific atmospheres that link with our emotions or with our feelings, our sensation of the space. So uh, in, in this example, in the Jade Epoco Park in Taiwan, Maybe you don't see this beautiful or aesthetically, you know, arousing. Oh, but it would be interesting to see. It's built. It's not theoretical. It would be interesting to see how you feel according to different um, humidities, temperature, you know, uh, situation of shade and sun, and so on. If we talk about new architecture or architecture design driven by how or what people do inside, I think Parra and Müller are a must in here. They have designed the so-called Paritorios Humanizados, which is humanized uh, uh, delivery rooms. And they have taken into account what, how labor happens and what, what's the labor like. What is the laboring mother seeing and perceiving and hearing to? So the labor can happen, you know, in the most satisfying way. And I, I mean, I think this, this, is, this is fundamental. This is what architecture is about, you know, wearing the user's shoes and feeling in their, in their shoes what they feel like and helping them. And the best way to do it is 
having experienced this beforehand. So they're Para and Muller, they're, they've, they're both mothers and they have both gone through different kinds of deliveries. And I think this is key in order to do a successful design. If you cannot do that, talk to the user. I go back to the interview, you know? Maybe you cannot experience exactly what this person is feeling, but then, you know, use the conversation and the empathy to deal with that. If we talk about new architecture, I think we have to talk about kids' shelters, you know? Kids are wonderful. This is my son, Max, the one on the first one. He loves going underneath that. Well, now he's way bigger than this. Um, kids, they base the decisions on their comfort. They're not biased. Their frontal cortex is not developed yet, so they don't make decisions according to what other people think or according to what's good or bad. They made decisions according to what their body needs. There is no in inhibitory, you know? So they're wonderful, you know? Like, like dogs, for instance, where do they lie down in a house? In the place they're mo most comfortable. So this, this is so basic. I mean, we don't really need research to support these ideas. We just need to pay close attention, or at least that's what I think. And to close up with this, Animals. I just mentioned dogs. This is another book by Johanny Palasma, which is called um, Animal Architecture. Okay. Um, he explains how different animals build different kinds of architecture. And for instance, the compass thermit test, this one, I don't know, I think it can last up to a thousand years or something like that. But it's used during the, that thousand years, people living there. Okay which is something that I'm, I'm, I'm having debates with my colleagues lately, like why are we producing architecture to last longer than we do, you know, if we're going to die. So, well, I think this is a debate to, to, to talk about. Now, regarding what, well, regarding what I'm sharing with you, we do need research. We need to move on, we need to continue, we need to make mistakes, you need, we need to be brave and, and say, okay, Let's move forward. Probably wrong, but being wrong is cool. Because someone has to say, hey, you're wrong because I have a different idea. And I can't wait for that. Um, what I did together with my colleague Marta, we created a uh, research team. And we have no funding, we have nothing. We only are looking forward to move forward. <laughs> and we are researching about phenomenological representation. So trying to figure out how to drive, how to share all these things that we cannot see, that we cannot touch, but they distinguish and they make our experience in the space unique. Um, to continue with the research, we need hypothesis. And Today I'm going to share something really special with you, which are some of the hypotheses that John Paul Eberhardt wrote in his book. Because as I said before, he designed, he, he left uh, a path drawn for us to walk through. And we have to use this information. This is what research is for, you know, opening doors and, and drawing paths. So I, I chose five different hypotheses. Uh, the first one, and well, remember, I hypothesis uh, here, it's not proved. So it's a sentence that he thinks it's true, okay, but we need to prove it. Um, for instance, neuroscience and design of educational places. They, he said, a child provided with a space that is approx uh, appropriately scaled to his or her size will have an adjusted sense of time and space that leads to reduce stress, greater feelings of security, and increased competence. So autonomy. A kid that dwells in space, designing at his or her scale, is helping them learning and being autonomous, you know, like like wearing shoes that you can you can put on your on your own that you not you do not help uh, you do not need help with. Um, if you were to design schools, use this. It's key. I mean, schools for kids. Regarding vision and light in architecture settings, oh, this is Hotel del Aire de Bardenas here in in uh, in Spain. I forgot to write down. It's a beautiful place as well. He said, the visual system's attention span, especially the visual field in the peripheral area, is restricted by the size of a window's opening. Okay, now we have a problem because vision is so trendy. We only talk 
about and everything is related to vision, to image. But actually, our vision is not, I mean, we can only see accurately in a very small part of our visual field. The rest is black and white. I always say, like, I, I do sometimes this exercise. So right now, my hand, this hand, I can see it with my peripheral vision, and it's black and white. It's not in color. Like, color starts somewhere here. Yeah? So you, you, can, do, you can do that. Um, so if, you, if we take this into account, we don't need to do like large vision spaces, you know? We have to use all those senses as well. Why don't we use smell? Why don't we use sound? Why don't we use textures? Uh, what's going on with balance, with memories? I mean, there are many more things than, than vision, but I think we have to wait until Instagram goes down or something, because <laughs> everything has to be photogenic, you know? But it's okay. Regarding memorial sacred places and memory, he said, the perceptual awareness of a small space, like the narthex, you know, like the entrance, it's, you're compressed, uh, as recorded in the frontal cortex, is stimulated by moving into a suddenly much larger space, the nave. This simulation produces a sense of expansion, okay? So we feel the compression, and then we, shoot, we feel, and, it's like, and people usually get quiet, you know? They usually speak, blah, 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 and then, so if you want people to be quiet when they enter somewhere, change the height of the ceiling. <laughs> it, I mean, this is interesting, but when you visit places, you know, just observe, because, you know, observing is really interesting, and you learn a lot. Now, regarding places and spaces uh, and the design of facility for the aging, which I think is a wonderful topic. Um, and this is amazing. It says, family dining style, small groups that serve themselves from prepared dishes, promotes socialization and better eating habits and leads to better health. This, is, this goes together with another hypothesis regarding lighting. So if people see better, you know, especially uh, grown-ups or, or elderly people, if they are like exposed to better lighting, they recognize faces better and they tend to socialize better and they go, they go to the dining halls more often and they socialize and this has an impact on the health. So it's, I mean, when we talk about neuroarchitecture, it's not about one single thing, but it's a compound, because the sum of the different perceptions is more than the perceptions individually. Like, if you want to listen to Mozart, some, some, some sort of, of piece, uh, listening to the instruments individually makes no sense, whereas if you listen to the whole harmony, you know, it gives you the feeling, the emotion. So that's, the architecture is about that. So about all the different things that happen when, when action, you know, continues. Um, and I believe this is the last one. Systems, neuroscience, and building systems apply to uh, workplace design. I apply this hypothesis also in uh, schools or universities because they're, you know, you're actually thinking and working, you're using your brains so, so they can work in both directions. And he said, sensory-rich environments stimulate memory and learning. I have chosen the images of the mice again on purpose because I think we're on a step that we still need to define what sensory-rich environments mean in architecture. We are now in a moment in which we are experiencing a hyper-stimulation. There are so many different stimuli everywhere. These LED screens, audios, different colors, different textures, different uh, people speaking, this, that. And th this, this uh, I mean, this is somehow destroying our ability of concentration. And I think we're m in a moment in which we need like a lower impact atmosphere. You know, we need to reduce the amount of stimuli that we have. Because I I've got the feeling that we're like numb somehow. And I include myself, because I experience the same urban spaces that you do, you know, like I can't concentrate. I, yeah. So there is still a, a definition of the sensory-rich environment's meaning uh, to be done. And I would love to work on that, actually. Now time to share with you. How are you going? All good? Yeah? Second time of the talk, I'm going to share with you how this happened. Okay, where is Susan? Is she here? Yeah, so you were asking, what's this? Because we were playing with this before. Um, this started back in 2016, so a long time ago. And today I have to say that I am part of the project. I, I was like, well, 
in charge of the theoretical part. Um, but I worked together with Alicia Gutierrez, uh, what she gave to the project or her, yeah, her, her approach uh, became from the material we use, the recent material, that you see that changes the color. And uh, from Sarah San Gregorio, uh, she, she has this maker mindset, so she produced the, the, the toy itself, right? So I'll tell you how this happened. This is Mediala Prado in Madrid, who unfortunately moved to Matadero. This building by Langarita Navarro, beautiful building, it had a research hub. Okay, so it had like this small housing for, for researchers. And uh, Sara San Gregorio was a researcher in-house. She was working there in the media lab, in the, in the fab lab under, downstairs, producing toys, right? Producing things, working on her research. And um, this is the public space they have. Sarah invited me, and in her invitation, it was something, we had a conversation, it was something like, Anna, we have a problem because many, many kids come after school, come to the, to the building, and they're, they're all over the place. They take stuff, they, they play with everything they have around, they go to the office space where people are having meetings, and it's a disaster. And uh, the thing is that since the toys they're using are mine, are the ones that I'm, I'm developing in my research, well, there is a possibility that they remove these toys or they keep them in boxes so the kids don't use them, so they don't misbehave. And, and she was like, I, I don't want this to happen, you know? I want them to provide with specific atmospheres that without uh, adults controlling, without a set of rules written, without someone saying, no, you don't do that, you know? Because you know, kids don't play like that. Um, they would behave in a certain way. So she was like, can you come and help me? And I said, well, I have no idea. I will go and, and observe because this is what I know what to do. Um, so in this project, we, we have briefly four steps. We did an analysis and diagnosis, which was me living there for a week and being there with Sarah, observing the kids and talking with her a lot. Then we wrote a few conclusions. We did a design and we, they, they because it's, this part was Sarah and, and Alicia, they, they produce a prototype or several prototypes. And then part of this as a research work was spreading and, and sharing the prayer that, like what I'm doing today with you. So in the first step, when we were, uh, well, I didn't mention it, but there were three things that we analyzed, the, the users, the playing devices, and the spaces. So when we were analyzing the users, these are, these are pictures that I took when I was there. I was recording them, and I was observing the way they would move without any, I mean, in, their, in the atmosphere that they were every day. I, we didn't make any changes, you know? So... Uh, the problem with the users, all right? There were four to nine-year-old kids, groups, sometimes groups of four, five, two, three siblings, 20, because there was a birthday, totally random, okay? Um, and they were students from schools of the neighborhood. When I was talking to them and talking to their parents, one of the things that we realized was that they, they um, came from schools that had really small playgrounds, because they were in the center of Madrid. So during their school day, they uh, haven't had been running, for instance, or jumping. So they came like incandescent, you know, they came like looking forward to moving. Um, so this was, this was probably one of the problems that we spot, uh, because they came running, you know, like Wah! looking forward to playing. Um, we realized by observing that the scale of the building didn't match their size and their necessities. And I haven't, when, I, when we did this, I hadn't had read uh, Paul, John Paul Everhart, you know? So imagine when I read him and I said, oh dear, this is what happened, you know, in Media Lab. And their kids, they were looking for social interaction and play. They didn't want to disturb, you know? Adults, they were thinking, they, came, they come here and they disturb. I was like, well, that's the impact that their game has on your perception, but their the kids' perception is totally different. Then we analyzed different playing devices. So by playing devices, I mean objects that we would drop in there. So we, we left, every day we would leave a different set of, of uh, things, you know, like boxes, and some, sometimes they were toys, sometimes they weren't toys, and see how they would interact with them, okay? So we saw that very often they had way too many things, that many of these things were hard to play with, you know, because they were heavy, they were uncomfortable, they, um, they would get hurt sometimes. 
and there was no relationship between the object, the location, and what to do with it. So everything was like, you know, messed up. Like very, like a disaster, there was no organization. And there was a big lack of belonging, like a lack, a lack of identity of the, the object and the space, you know? It was like, well, this is a whatever, random box, you know? It was, there was nothing special on it. We continued and then we were thinking or studying specifically the space and then tr first cool thing uh, came to us. So we saw that the open space, they were shouting, they were running, they were jumping, but then when the space was smaller or there, were, there was less light or the less sound, they would become calmer. So, what, so I, and I remember I told Sarah, Sarah, I think there is a relationship of what they do and where they do it. And now you would think, well, of course, obviously, Anna, they're not gonna jump in a small space because they basically can't. Okay, <laughs> but now I know about it. So if I want them to not jump, then I will build a cave, for instance. So one of our, our toys was a cave. So they would go in and they would be quiet. Um, so there was a clear linkage between the space and the game that, that, that was happening, right? That is, that is seen, that is appreciated. Like here, the kids in this pic, they were, they were throwing these uh, red things all the way there. They were running and, and throwing them. But if we put these things indoors, they would use them as sofas. And it was the same object. Okay? So they wouldn't launch the object indoor. So this is, this is what I meant by this. And then what, what do they do when they play? You know, what, what's the games they, they play? Because, and I, I mentioned it, there was nobody saying, today you play this game or you take this toy and do that. It was free play, totally, because this was one of the, of the main ideas. And they were so spontaneous, they were really curious, and they love interaction with all the kids and with the environment, with the building. There's this little girl who was there trying to look for something, I don't know what he was looking for, but you know, it's like trying to interact. And then we realized that if adults remain apart, the joy was greater. When the adults would interact with the kids, you know, the, the scale of the game and the, the atmosphere would change dramatically. So we had to do something that the adults didn't feel in need to interact. So kids, because playing is key to learning. I mean, the best way to learn is by playing. And yeah, homo ludens, this is, this is basic as well. So for us, it was, it, was, it was important that the kids could do things freely. So we saw a link as well between the kids' corporal needs and the game perform. So some kids, were in need of jumping and screaming, but some other kids were in need of being quiet and relaxed and hidden. And those two kids shouldn't share space because they would disturb each other. So we had to design a space for those who need to jump and shout and rap, and then some spaces for those who need to be calmed down because we have different rhythms. And everything is about balance with the outside and homeostasis, you know, so they would yeah, they would pollute themselves if they're together. So at the end, we saw that space, play, and body were clearly link linked through game. Okay, so we said, okay, we have the project has to be a game, something a game with no instructions, with uh, not linked to anything. And then the hypothesis came in. Like this was, I, I was about to leave, you know, I was about to, to finish the, my stay and with Sarah we were speaking and we said, well, the kind of game kids play is tightly related to the space they play in. So if we change the space, the game will change without us saying, now you play in a different way. No, because we've changed the space so the behavior would change. Um, then we were thinking, well, there are similarities are shown in language that link together the qualities of the space uh, the game and the kids' bodies performing the game. Okay, so uh, when they were, this was this was the staircase. I don't know if you know the building, but this this was one of the parts of the staircase. So when they were here, what what do you imagine they were playing? They were not moving because they can. They were sitting down. The, their voice was pretty low. It wasn't high. They wouldn't. They usually wouldn't scream. When, uh, when they were here, they were running. So they were behaving in a very different way depending on the space they were playing. So then we said, okay, 
our project is going to be three different spaces for three different corporal needs. And we're going to use the same toy, for, but in a different scale or given in a different place. Okay, so the first, and then there was uh, there was like a kind of workshop that uh, Sarah with her colleagues would do and see if the behavior would happen, and it did happen. She would tell me, Anna, wow, you're not going to believe we did play in surfaces, and we did indeed, you know, we were playing along all the, the surface that we wanted to, and people were spreading it, and the, the scale of the game was big, and people were singing and shouting and there were kids running and they would do paths. We did the playing volumes in which uh, Sarah developed this really big pieces so the kids would need their strength and they would need to be sitting in order to play. So here they, they, they can't run, you know, because if they run they don't play. So this was, this was very interesting as well. They, they could build a beautiful cave. And then we did playing with light that this was uh, inside of, we were doing these caves and covering them, and inside we would put a light table. So the kids would have to go in crawling, you know, and they were, of course, they were crying, they were quiet, only two kids would fit in, so they would have to wait until one leaves and then another one enters, and uh, they were playing through concentration. And the scale of the game changes. So here the scale is like really large, here we call it, so here it would be, Two to one, so the game twice as big as the kit. Here one to one, the scale of the game is the scale of the kit. And here one to two, so the, the scale is different, right? So they need concentration, they need to develop what they're seeing and to be, you know, focused. I call this a perception funnel. So the intensity and the number of a stimuli, you know, decreases and provides a different impact in each atmosphere. So basically, if you want people to be quiet, turn off the light. Okay, they would do, ooh, yeah, and then people would be quiet, okay? Or if you want to enjoy your food, close your eyes. So remove stimuli and there will be, you know, better insight. This is what I think what we need to do nowadays. For developing every, you know, this, this would be the volume, the surface, the light, we had different kinds of parameters, two kinds, phenomenological, according to what was happening, and atmospherical, according to you know, the, the stimuli that, were, uh, that happened in there, the kind of game and things. So as I said, in playing surfaces, we did these workshops. At the beginning, it was with these pieces that, that Sarah had done, and the idea was that kids would run and would move, and it did happen. Playing with volume, as I told you, they were building these caves, creating spaces inside of the spaces, you see, and this is Helena playing inside with different rocks, different games. And playing with the light, that was, this was the project that was in the Biennale in Venice, was the one that was done with, with these beautiful pieces. That now we cannot see it, but with natural light, well, you may see it. Well, if someone wants to see it afterwards, yeah, I think uh, it changes. So kids, and when you're outside, you can see the reflection and the shade has different colors. It's so cool. And not only for kids, but also for adults, you know? So you have a time in which you enjoy yourself and try to create different shapes. And so you're, you're training your, your concentration. We need a lot of this, I think, nowadays. Silence, you know? And the best part of this research is that, as I told you, it started in 2016 and it continues still nowadays. Because Sarah nowadays is still doing loads of workshops with the you know things that have evolved from this this has this has transformed as i showed you this you know these these workshops are not done in the exact same way but the, the pieces have changed and this is moving and i am not linked with with this research at the moment like technically linked but it's really nice to see that now they have even created a store in which they are uh, they're selling these products so I think, you know, this, this is what research is about. So you, you try to solve a problem, you're successful with it, and, yeah, and then and you continue, and then more things happen. So we're about to finish now regarding spreading it, or spreading the word. Playing Spaces, this project that I've been telling you about, is a living project. And despite being born as an architectural idea, because the idea, well, I, I didn't mention, we did these three different atmospheres in the Media Las Prado. 
So when the kids would come, they would either go to the corridor and jump and draw on the floor and do all these crazy things. And when they were inside of the building, they would go inside of the cave and be quiet, which was the, the key, you know, shouting there in that place and being quiet inside of the building. And that, that was happening. So that was, that was really cool. And the positive thing is that it was merging transversal disciplines. So it goes across disciplines because human beings were not only in architecture or neuroscience or psychology, but merging pedagogy, design, engineering is what made this project possible. And I think architecture should about, be about this. So neuroarchitecture is the one that grows and develops together with the human beings. So. And, and this is a sample of what can, we, what can be done if we listen carefully to the user's needs and work harmoniously with other professionals. So when people ask me, well, is there neuroarchitecture, is it a thing or, or it isn't? I say, well, maybe it has to be a thing nowadays because we're no longer doing this. So if, if we need a term to go back to building for the people, then let's, let's name it. You know, let's use the name. But, I mean, architecture, I think it should be this. I, I really think, yeah. And this is everything from me now. <laughs> Thank you. I believe we have questions and answers. It's 10 past nine. Anyone? Yeah. Yes. Perfect. Um, hello. Yeah. What's your name? Sorry. Carla. <laughs> Carla. Hello, Carla. <laughs> Hi. Um, I was. Um, I want to ask what was the material of the last prototype of the game, and what you think it will happen if the material will be like different uh, that that was uh, will be like influence the behavior of the uh, child maybe okay uh, this is metacrilato con un baño iridescente sorry i don't know this in english uh, <laughs> iridescent material yeah yeah it's it's uh, it's a plastic with uh, with some some um, Coating, like erasing coating. Um, sorry, I knew it in English. <laughs> uh, well, actually, this is the very last version of this toy. At the beginning, it was made of cardboard. Well, we had cardboard and we had, uh, um, it was uh, DM, like uh, mid density, so very thin things. So we tried different things. The thing is that the object is not only the object, but also the atmosphere where you place it. So depending on where you play, the behavior changes. I mean, I don't behave the same way with a pencil in this context, but in this context, else, you know? So it's a matter of, of everything. And we can't, well, I don't know if we can, but I think we should not uh, create patterns of behavior. That's extremely complex, because every brain is different, every person is different, so we can try to understand what is most likely to happen. And of course, there were always kids who would say, ah, oh, no, and break it, you know? But, well, that's what life is, you know? But most likely to happen, uh, it was like if we gave this toy to a person under the sunlight, they would be amazed. But some kids would last five seconds, and some other kids, 15 minutes, depending on, on every person's nervous system or ex previous experience. <laughs> you start thinking about this um, maybe in Spanish later? Yeah, of course, of course, <laughs> I can translate. You mean that when did we add the material to the toy? Sí, o sea, yeah. como que empezaste como a pensar, digamos, en el proyecto en base a la atmósfera, ¿no? O sea, como mi pregunta yeah, era yeah, como, yeah. como oh, el okay. material también como, sobre todo el tema de las texturas, mm -hmm. eh, que es como que también hace como otro estímulo y como hoy también a veces al estar como tan con tantos estímulos visuales se vuelve tan importante el tema del material y las texturas y también en base al, a la frase, eh, lo que habías dicho, como que el, la piel es uno de los 
órganos como más extensos que tenemos, ¿no? O sea, creo que juega como un rol súper importante. Y me, me interesaba sobre todo el tema del... Claro, neuroarquitectura también el tema del, del material, lo mucho que a lo mejor puede como influenciar. Here, the thing is that what I was in, because we were three of us working, right? So I would say, okay, the sensory parameters have, I mean, the feeling has to be this. Sarah, what do you have? This toy. <laughs> okay, so what can we do? Well, let's try to change the scale or do that. I mean, we, we, did, we couldn't do anything we wanted. You know, we're very restricted. Very restricted. It had to be something that Sarah could produce. And then the material came when Sarah met uh, Alicia and, and she told me, I've met this girl and she works with this amazing material. You're going to freak out. When I, when I saw it, I was like, oh, let's do the pieces with that, you know? So it's not, I mean, it's difficult to take decisions, like precise decisions. It's more like a, a try and fail, you know? And what do we have? Okay, let's try with that. Because when you have limits, it's best things come up, I think. Um, I have a question. Yeah. Do you think that also the round is a friendly morphological uh, image? Mm -hmm. Like, uh, I don't know, like building something pointy, maybe it's like more... Well, there is research about that. We saw a paper. Anyone from the previous workshop wants to answer this question? <laughs> well, they don't have a microphone, but there. I mean, it's, I, I, I don't like, although I say that, I don't like saying I think or... But I, but I do think, so sometimes I say it. Uh, there is a paper uh, that they studied and a research that they studied the impact of curvilinear spaces, curvilinear forms in people, and in with expert and non-expert, uh, you know, uh, people. And it is proved that we perceive beauty in, in round, uh, round shapes, and there is a little bit bigger sense of willing to enter in a curved space. But it doesn't mean that we like them better, you know? It is said, and I've read that it's said that it's linked to our, our ancestors, that we were outside, you know, we lived in the savannah for millions and millions of years. This urban living is pretty new. <laughs> um, so it's said that it's linked with that. Mm -hmm. And the other thing that I was thinking... Oh, but we didn't do it curved because of that. Oh. Okay, if that was a question. No, it's because we uh, waste less material. <laughs> I mean, that, that, that is also know, important. It's, it's a matter of, of everything together. Of course. Yeah, yeah. And it's more flexible. Yeah, you can do more. Do things. you think that neural architects, for example, is different uh, in Asia than in Occidental? Like, uh, how it, it changed, even the point of view, like for us, for example, darkness is not the same for them. Mm -hmm. uh, there is another value of some spaces and colors and the difference of light using it. Okay. Well, as I said, I believe new architecture is a perspective. Okay, it's a mindset. So if I were to design something in Asia, uh, I will have to study really well the culture and the people and the vernacular architecture from there. I mean, I would find a partner who knows that better than me. You know, so I think like working with people who know other things better than you, it's key. Um, I don't think it's uh, Spanish new architecture and Chinese new. I I don't trust. Any like the global perspective. I, my, <laughs> right. I, it's a global, because, oh, excuse me. <laughs> it's global because we're human beings, you know? And for instance, there is this study about emotions in, in the faces and uh, by, by um, Ekman, Paul Ekman. And uh, a happy face is a happy face in Asia, in Africa, in Oceania, in everywhere. And actually dogs can, you know, uh, understand our fa facial emotions, fa like emotion recognition by, by the face. Is it goes across cultures, so there are some things that link us together. Mm -hmm. And then I always talk about the you know, limbic system and how our reaction, our bottom-up reaction, that is what link us together. You know, when, when we're afraid, it doesn't matter where you're from or which one is your culture, that if you feel threatened, if you feel that something is wrong, you're going to react in the same way. You know, It changes when, when it goes to the cortex and then you're rational and you're using your background experience. That's different. And then culture interacts and that gets way more complex. I'm still at the very beginning, like trying to understand what's this very basic uh, reaction from, from the beginning. Yeah. 
I, I just wanted to say something in, in between. Um, you, you were mentioning the, the, the um, vernacular architecture, or if you go to another country, how we would deal with this. And you said that um, architecture should be about that many times. Um, as we are studying here interior spaces, um, I think the, the important thing is that we introduce elements of architecture, knowing by students what these elements actually mean in space, um, so that they can apply them and knowing the consequences, the consequences of how we would react. Now you were talking about round shapes. So the first thing is to know what shapes really mean, you know? what all, is all this that surrounds us. And that actually is universal. So everything goes back to something that we all know. The thing is, by culture, education, and all these things that are put into us while we grow up, that changes. Perception changes because they're manipulated. But actually, the roots, we all share. So we all share certain um, reactions. And I think this is the, the, the interesting thing in space. That's a universal training. Um, and you're studying this, this subject. So I think it's, it's very important that um, you're always conscious of that kind of um, responsibility that we have no? when we try to uh, design space. Now you. I have a question. Well, in fact, it's Miguel that has two questions. The first one is, uh, which is the difference between psychoarchitecture and neuro, neuro architecture? Ah, good question. <laughs> I, I, I actually don't know <laughs> because, well, psychology is also linked to neuroscience, but um, they're two, di two different disciplines. So I, uh, maybe it's the same thing, you know? You may write a definition of psychoarchitecture. But I, I, I have to mention to you that I talked with Marta Delgado, with my colleague sometimes, because she studies cognition. And I was like, hey, Marta, why don't you label the term psychoarchitecture before someone takes it? <laughs> because now, like, we're in this uh, fashion of labeling things, you know? I have to admit that I didn't want to, to use the term neuroarchitecture many conversations with friends, and they were like, but, but you're working on this. And I was like, yep, yeah, but I don't want to label it. But then I was seeing what, what was being done, selling your architecture as the recipe for what? And I said, no way. <laughs> I mean, uh, we have to study many different things, and it's not only about n neuro, you know? It's like when everything was labeled B. A neuro, if, if there are no neurons, then there is no perception, then it doesn't exist. So, so. But we somehow, as I explain it, we need it. Because nowadays, architecture has moved a bit in a direction mm, that forgot about human beings. So psychoarchitecture, neuroarchitecture, we can use both. <laughs> Second one. Uh, I think there is a sentence. Let me say, uh, brain relates not only with uh, not only to architecture, but also with other brains. Mm -hmm. This reinforces the idea of social and globalization. Yeah, because we don't only interact. Uh, yeah, Robert's research is about dynamic brains and how the brain not only interacts with the built space but with other brains. Mm -hmm. Play with develop how uh, you develop is uh, uh, <laughs> a muestra a sample yeah a sample of this yeah mm -hmm. thank you thank you Robert uh, I have a question regarding the um, the little yeah the thing <laughs> uh, how on a scale how much would you say it fixed the problem of having children roaming around so did this new project focus all the children driving and playing towards it to leave the adults alone uh, did it like drive some of them was it like a long term fix so it uh, yeah. the the beautiful thing was that it was set up in the way we exactly designed it it was set up for a short amount of time would say less than a month because very quickly what they did is that they they created the so-called la regadera which was a set of activities 
which it was well, they were in activities, but it was a space with very low light. There was very little light, and with these devices, and everyone would go there to la regadera. So they would not go to the volume and the you know and the surfaces, but they would go to play with the light. They would go. They would go to a larger space, and we created like a huge black box. Well, we it was it was, it was Sarah and her team, and uh, they were they would meet in that space. And the only thing they were doing is that before entering, they would make you know sit down in a circle, and they would say, "Okay, kids, parents, we're going to use together this space. We have to try to remain quiet and relax because it was very big." We're going to be barefoot, and this is from everybody, and someone will come tomorrow and play with what we're going to use today. So we have to collect the toys when we're finished and so on. And I, I went there a couple places with kids, and it worked really good. There, there were no instructions. And what this, this evolved, and Sarah was inviting different artists to put their you know, constructions and their toys and their things and in, in that space. And the only limit was that it had to be pretty dark in the room. Mm -hmm. So this evolved, you know, it was playing with the light. It started in a cave, you know, like small cave and then do, 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 and it's changing and, and it's still moving. And now Sara turned this into La Juguetoria which, you know, and this is a work she has done on her own. I mean, this was like 2016, so it was like many years ago. Many things had happened. So it's evolving, which I think it's, now I see it and I'm, I'm happy about it. It's because they don't get it on the internet. Eh, mi pregunta va, a lo largo del tiempo, ¿el comportamiento de los niños se mantiene o tienen que estar cambiando las actividades y las piezas para que no, el mismo comportamiento, o sea, no se aburren de tener las mismas piezas durante meses y estar jugando con lo mismo? O sea, ¿qué tanto necesita evolucionar un espacio a lo largo del tiempo para que el cerebro siga manteniendo como que ese interés por el espacio? So she's asking about how, how long does it take to the brain to get used to the stimuli. So there is like four places. It depends a lot of the brain. It depends a lot of the user. Like uh, my son, Max, can be playing with, with two small, th with this toy, he can be playing 15 minutes, 30 minutes, one hour, and he's three years old. Some other kids can be five minutes and they're gone, they're done. So, uh, but you know what happened? That they could move from one atmosphere to another. Because the original idea was that the kids, that they needed this movement, that they had to release all this energy, they would go to the space and uh, the, play the, the surface. So they will be running and running, and then when they're tired, like, okay, where do I go next? Oh, I'll go there. And then I build something, and then, oof, now I'm tired. Where, I'm going to the cave. And then they will go to the cave. And, they have released the energy, you know, they have, they're, they're tired already, so they need something more relaxed. Whereas some other kids, they don't like, they don't have so much activity inside, you know, they don't have so much energy to release, so they will go directly to the cave, for instance. So, it depends, yeah. And I'm sorry that there are no recipes, but that's the beauty of life, you know. Like, very often people tell me, oh, tell me the principles of, and I say, no, read books. <laughs> because the, no principles, we're all different. And that's the beauty, you know, it's a part of a process. Yeah. Eh, mi pregunta iba también un poco más a largo plazo. Digamos, los niños eh, juegan ahí durante meses, años, llevan eh, a largo plazo, ya jugaron todos los juegos de diferentes formas. ¿Cómo no sé eh, cómo un espacio debe evolucionar a través del tiempo? Well, the thing is that the one that balls is the kid. The kid changes. You know, so maybe they were going for one month or two months, and then they they don't they oh they grow up. So this is this is the first thing, and then the second thing, as, as I mentioned, we did these three spaces, but very rapidly, Sarah took one of the spaces and developed la regadera in the top floor, like this huge space. And at the beginning, it was the same setup, but after two three rounds, she realized that she could invite guests and create different atmospheres. So kids would wish to go every weekend or every afternoon there. But, that, but you had to book. Yeah, because they were, it was a closed space, so they have to book. So uh, you have to change, of course. That's something. I mean, we should do it at home, you know? I recommend you change your furniture, move the sofa, move your bed. Yeah. 
how any other question it's 9:30 by the way just one one thing that you talked about the senses mm -hmm. 34 senses or something you <laughs> yeah, you yeah, discovered like a lot. <laughs> I, I know that there was the, the classic Aristotelian five senses mm -hmm. that everyone knows uh, and most probably we have much more but I think it's it's very interesting that you mentioned that you know that we could experience actually um, our different senses and 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 most probably everyone had has its own um, what was this based on uh, what what kind of senses do you mention there well here and i i've also this is very linked or i think at least i, I linked it or i've read it linked uh, with for instance practice as meditation like when you practice meditation and self-awareness you can be aware of your blood pressure because you can feel your heart can feel your skin in a different way or you can you, because we've got interoception which is the feeling that we have of our inner body we can feel the the strength or we can feel the pressure of our muscles or of our joints okay if you concentrate we should be able this is something we can train but you can sometimes well you can feel your stomach or your heart or your lungs and in this in this uh, board in this table that he wrote, uh, I think there was something like the, the, the pH of the liquid inside of the brain. You know, like, like how do you perceive that? You know, uh, but well, th this is uh, this is a sample. He this is what he wrote with his team. So I, I cannot perceive that, but maybe there is someone who has like I don't know certain ability, so he can perceive it. I've done meditation and I, I can, if I'm concentrated, I can feel my heartbeat and I can feel my blood pressure. A different thing is to say or to name or to label mm. what's my blood pressure. Mm. But if, if I train it, I can get aware, I can be aware of it and then, you know, I can understand it. You have the, the phone that gives us every date. <laughs> That's <laughs> terrible. It's totally contradictory. Um, well, yeah, the, with the senses, I think is is interesting to um, experiment. To, yeah, to, yeah, to, to experiment to especially, experiment. and go deeper into what we what we could know about ourselves mm -hmm. from the from the physical space, go, moving to some space that we that we can discover. Yeah, it, it's what we do in the research team, and one of the activities we're willing to to do. Uh, well, is trying to, for instance, uh, do metaphors between the flavors, like the amount of flavors and textures and sounds that we experience when we eat, and the space we dwell in. So try to define a space with the same amount of adjectives that you can use to describe, uh, you know, something that you're eating. Like people that, that they do like wine tasting or olive oil tasting, they can describe in such a precise way the, you know, the scents and the smell and the texture and the, so why don't we try to do this with space, for instance? There's a, there's a restaurant in, in Berlin, maybe in, in Barcelona, it also exists, where you eat in, in complete darkness. Do you know? The, the, Maybe it exists here. I don't it was there, there was one but here in Barcelona, but it closed. And oh, now yeah, there is closed. they've opened one in Madrid. We do it in the workshops. Like Anarcia, who left, we did it in the workshop, and it was it was interesting. It heightens the, the you know the what everyone was so quiet, of course, because they didn't see each other. So they were quiet, therefore they were enjoying the food much better. You enjoy the food, and and uh, all the other senses are heightened. And they're heightening. The, the, this is uh, an experience. Um, yeah. Oh, there's many things, I guess. Yeah, this forever thing. Any other questions? Anyone want to? Yeah. Don't you think that it's also very important to build these kind of spaces for adults? Totally, for everybody. Yeah, yeah. Especially adults. Especially adults. <laughs> Unlearned yeah, for yeah. many things. You, yeah. you were saying this thing of... Um, Kids jumping right from one thing to other, and I, I start thinking about adults that sometimes we have this kind of multitasking life of being like actually jumping from topics or tasks or responsibilities. And I think that also sometimes parents take the game of the kids to calm down or to connect to that moment if they allow themselves. But how beautiful can be to this kind of playground as some section to also introduce adults to become a little bit more kids sometimes and 
to to start like connecting with their intuition and their well their perceptions in a different way. Yeah, well, there, there are two things that happen here is that adults, since we have more experience in the world, we're biased, totally biased, but what has happened before, and we judge, even if we don't want to, we judge everything. And that's pretty unfortunate. This is something we have to get rid of, try to, because kids, since they don't have experience, previous experience, they don't judge. Everything is fine and good and amazing. So this is a big difference. And they have imagination as well, because they have myelin in their neurons. They have a lot of myelin. And their imagination is so vivid and so true and so cool, you know, that they play with it. We don't have that, unfortunately. Uh, so trying to, you know, like when I did this classification of all these different people, I think we're like different animals, you know, like comparing birds to monkeys to elephants. Uh, our genes are really similar, you know, but. The, the nervous system is so different, and our maturity is so, so different that we are like different species. And then you talked about multitasking. Well, multitasking doesn't exist. It, we, we have so-called uh, divided attention. <laughs> I mean, there is no way you do two things at the same time. You do one thing, and then the other, and then one thing, and then the other, and then one thing, and the other, and the other, and then you don't do any of them. So it's. I think like now Nazaret Castellanos, I really recommend you read her. She is like proving and she's sharing how meditation is so, so helpful when it comes to awareness, to being here now, you know, and not, you know, moving around. Because and this was Hod <laughs> whoops, Hodorowski, uh, who I really liked for a certain time of my life. I, I read so many things from him. And I Podorowski said that when uh, we are shopping, we're thinking about where we're going to cook. When we're cooking, we're thinking wh how we're going to tidy up the kitchen. When we're tidying up the kitchen, we're thinking uh, that we're going to be late. When we're being late, we're thinking what are we going to order for dinner. And then we're all the time ahead, ahead, ahead. And then when are you, if you're cooking, you're cooking, okay? And you'll finish on time and everything will be fine, but do what you're doing. And Japanese are very good for that. Junihiro Chanizaki is like, Enjoy your bowl of rice in a black, beautiful bowl and see the shine of the white rice in it, you know, and enjoy the taste and the smell. So, you need this more than ever. Because, yeah, it makes no sense to me living somewhere that is not existing, you know. I can be thinking right now what I'm going to have uh, later for dinner with my friends, but then I wouldn't be sharing my inner self with you and you wouldn't be enjoying this. You're welcome. Thank you so much. You're most welcome. <laughs> Thank you.